John Moore first fought terrorism in 1967. He's still fighting it today. Walking patrol in Vietnam at night, alone, he searched for terrorist booby traps. He searched for terrorist bombs in his Jeep and saw what happened to those who didn't find them. John flew 57 combat missions over in Vietnam, many of those being hit by enemy gunfire. John went to join the Green Berets at Fort Bragg, where he trained to, <clears throat> to invade the Middle East. Kind of prophetic, isn't it? He also did classified studies of Middle East terrorists uh, for the Special Forces. He has special operations, covert operations, surveillance operations, bodyguard, and executive for executives, and stars like Charlton Heston, Jane Fonda, Ambassador Alan Keyes. He's a private investigator. He's a homicide detective. He was candidate for the United States Congress. Congress. He's a talk show host and an author of a book on personal security. And John still times, finds time to be a father, a husband, and a grandfather. And today, John will speak on topics of great concern to all Americans. And I give you, my friend, many years, ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore. Put Doc to work. And Doc, if you can give everybody one of my business cards. Okay, sure. That would be wonderful. I usually give that assignment to a child, but I don't see any children in the audience. No children. Was an intelligence analyst in the U.S. Army. There's, anybody here read the book um, about IQ? Anybody? Second, the top two percentiles. Get to be intelligence analyst. In fact, I had to sit at Hollywood for two months waiting for them to draft enough smart guys to have even have a class. <laughs> and I'm in touch with a former intelligence analyst all over the country. Mark Carnkey, everybody know Mark? He's a former intelligence analyst. And J.R. Nyquist, another Once intelligence you, uh, analyst. Understand the story, how important it is, I think you'll agree with me. I got a business card of a gentleman here. He didn't give me authority to use his name, but I'm just going to read you his title. <clears throat> Homeland Security Regional Response System Coordinator. He's connected, to say the least. So let's start from the beginning. In the late spring of the year 2000, I was approached by two friends of mine, both researchers, they told me that in the future, John is going to be this event happening. It's going to involve violent climate change, rising ocean levels, other things. And I listened to him patiently, and I, they, did, they approached me separately. One didn't know the other was talk, going to talk to me. And when they were finished, I said thank you, and I said, boy, you guys really need tinfoil hats really bad, you know. 200 mile an hour winds, rising ocean levels, violent climate change. So I approached a friend of mine and uh, he's connected to the ag lettered agencies, as we say. I told him the story. He basically told me I needed a tinfoil hat, but uh, he, said, <laughs> he said, John, I'll check it out. I'll get back with you, I'll check it out. So about three weeks later, he comes back from the East Coast, and he says, John, it's exactly what you said it was. The government's known about this since 1979. They've been getting ready for it since 1979. Yes, it's as real as real can be. I said, thank you. That's when I began my research. Things were going along pretty well. I was learning a lot, reading a lot of books. I'm a reader. And um, I was learning a lot about matters of science. Now, when I was in high school, I was on the football field. I, I wasn't paying attention to science. I wasn't. I'm sorry. But uh, I did learn some science. And I come to know that the government found out about this in 1979, and they needed a cover story. They're not about to tell all of you what's really going on. So they need a cover story to convince you it'll be okay. The cover story is man-made global warming. And that's all it is, is a cover story. They knew one of the many effects that would be happening 30 years in the future would be the apparent warming of the, of the Earth. One of the many. So they, they latched onto that. Now it's kind of morphing into climate change. But they used that cover story for quite a while. Fast forward to 
the summer of 2005. I'm having lunch with a friend of mine I've served with him in the 12th Special Forces Group. He was a, uh, is a dual service veteran. He also was a Navy SEAL. Navy SEALs spend a lot of time on submarines, in case you don't know. We have any submarine veterans here? When did you get out, sir? Uh, 96. 96. Okay, good. Anybody else? Any other submarine? Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about your service for a little bit here and, and not, too, not too far off here. Anyway, we're having lunch up here by the airport. And I'm talking about what I'm learning in my research. And he starts telling me about a classified briefing he attended in 1985, put on by the US Navy Submarine Corps. A classified briefing where he was told, gentlemen, during your lifetimes, not your children's, not your grandchildren's, during your lifetimes, these oceans are going to come out of their basins, flooding all coastal areas. Now, since then, and I don't know if I mentioned my bio or not, but I teach concealed carry classes. And I live 110 miles southwest of here, south of Steelville. Because I live in the Ozarks, I've got to meet and debrief about two dozen of these Navy submarine veterans at this point in time. They were students in my pistol class. So I'm talking to my friend, and he's, he's giving me the information he's got. One of the disadvantages of, de of debriefing these Navy veterans, they were sitting in the folding chairs. They weren't scientists. They were told what would happen. They weren't told how it would happen. It took me a couple of years to figure it out, but I did figure it out. It was only two months later, I was invited to be a guest speaker at a, at a college campus in Rolla to speak on terrorism. And little did I know there was going to be a co-speaker there, a retired intelligence officer. So we talk to the college students about terrorism. We go to a pizza place in Rolla. And we're sitting at a four-top table. I'm here. His wife's next to me. The intelligence officer's here. My friend, the college professor, is sitting here. And during the course of our conversation, I found out he does a three-year tour of duty with the Navy Submarine Corps. He's still there. <laughs> So I never met this man before in my life. I may never get to see him again. So I know I got to ask the question. Tell me what you know about rising ocean levels. Before he can speak up, his wife's sitting next to him. She says, John, we're stationed at the Pentagon. It's our last tour of duty. We're getting ready to retire. We had to pick a place to retire. We picked the Arkansas, Missouri Ozarks because of rising ocean levels. Well, I knew I had him then. I immediately made an appointment to meet him the following week in Rolla at Steak and Shake. And he was the second guy, my friend was the first, to help recreate the map that they were showing in these classified briefings of North America with new coastlines. Very scary new coastlines, I might add. Very scary. And as it would turn out, just a few weeks later, I have a pistol class. And at lunchtime, I always ask my students if any of them are veterans. It turned out, one of them was a retired officer from the U.S. Navy Submarine Corps. I can mention his name now, uh, Steve Canfield, because he since died of cancer, and, and way too many submarine veterans have cancer because of all the radiation they're exposed to. You probably know that, sir, don't you? Um, <coughs> his wife uh, was from Long, uh, is from uh, his widow now, from Long Island, and they moved to a little town called Viburnum, Missouri, population 650. The third highest point in the state of Missouri, the highest point for an incorporated community in the state of Missouri. When it came time to retire, he pointed a map and said to his wife, honey, that's where we're moving to. And he said, what? By Burnham, Missouri? There's no tea shops, there's no Macy's, there's no sex with, you know, she grew up in a house with servants, you know, <laughs> two stairways. That's my, that's my definition of a mansion. If you've got two stairways inside, it's a mansion. <clears throat> but they moved there. And they bought the biggest house in town. Very nice place. So I, made a, I immediately made an appointment with Steve to uh, meet with him and have lunch the following week. He made the third, third and final revisions, recreating the map that these veterans were shown at these classified briefings, showing North America with new coastlines. Steve has since died of cancer, and so I can talk about his name now. Luckily, uh, 
My friend Tim Spencer doesn't have a pension. All these other submarine veterans, they have a pension. They're not about to jeopardize their pension to share what they know in terms of classified information. They're not about to do that. That's not going to happen. Tim Spencer, in his first tour of duty on a submarine, he shows up and he reports to the officer in charge of building, along with two other guys. The officer in charge of build, building says, gentlemen, we don't have bunks for you. You're going to string up hammocks between the warheads of the Polaris nu nuclear weapons, missiles. Don't worry, no radiation. It's going to be fine. Well, it turned out, eight hours a day, seven days a week, all three men were being radiated, ionizing radiation, almost lethal do dose of radiation. He's got 100% disability. They can't take that away from him. Dan, would you hold up that DVD, please? Global warming. That's, that's Command Sergeant Dan, Dan Page, and uh, thank you, Dan. Um, Tim Spencer agreed to go public with me, and he's, I interview him on here about the, uh, seeing the map when he was in New Orleans doing classified work. So he, he walks into this office. Everything on the floor is classified. He's a young sailor in his mid-twenties. He sees this map with strange markings on the, on the wall. There's a chief petty officer there. And he, he says, chief, what is this? What does this mean? And the chief, you know, this guy's old enough to be his father. He says, well, young man, when you retire, you want to retire in one of those white spaces. That's where you want to retire to. That was the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks. And Tim Spencer said, yes, sir, you know, and, and went on about his business. Tim and his wife, Laurie, lovely lady, they were in one of my pistol classes, and we're talking about this at lunch. And uh, she says, John, I'm from Central Florida. I don't like weather. I don't like ice and snow. I like Missouri. We're here because of that darn map. <laughs> Interesting how Tim. I was at a fundraiser. We had a man charged with first-degree murder. Um, horrific, horrific case in a lot of ways I'm not going to go into. A fundraiser put on by the Western Cherokee Nation down in Salem, Missouri. So it's good food, live music, everybody's enjoying themselves. I see this guy walking around with this official-looking ID badge that said, Tim Spencer, Director of Emergency Preparedness, Western Cherokee Nation. So I introduced myself. The DVD that Dan held up, I just got it back from the duplicator that week. And I didn't know at the time he was a submarine veteran. I just knew he was interested. So I, I handed him a copy of the DVD. I said, Tim, I'd like you to watch this and get back with me. He said, okay, I, I barely know this guy. He calls me up a week later, and he says, John, I've seen your map before. I said, really? He says, yeah, I've seen your map before. I was in New Orleans doing classified work, and he told me the story about the map he saw. One of my listeners, and this is one of the things, Bruce, I love about being a talk show host. It's like having a private intelligence agency. <laughs> Seriously, it is. You know that. You've been a talk show host. One of my listeners in Montana, he, got, he gets this DVD. He watches it. And this was 2009. He watched it. He calls me up and he says, John, I saw your map. I said, really? He says, yeah. It was 1979. I was a young sailor down in New Orleans. And I got the job of setting up a briefing room for a group of admirals for a Saturday morning briefing. He says, John, admirals don't do Saturday morning briefings. <laughs> he said, I set up the chairs, the lights, the sound system. There was this map on the wall. Strange. It made no sense whatsoever. He said, until I saw your DVD, I didn't have a clue these past 30 years what that map meant because I was outside the locked doors when they had the classified briefing. So the admirals show up. These guys all went to Annapolis together. How's the wife? How's the kid? Telling jokes, slap on the back. You know, good Saturday morning. Time for a classified briefing. And they walk in the door. The doors are locked. They come out of the briefing. They all look like their puppy dogs had died. They had just got one of the very first briefings. One of the very first. Now, there was a time frame, the best as I can tell, about six years from 79 to 85, when the, the enlisted men weren't getting access to this information. I have not found an enlisted man early in 85 that had access to this information. Now we have one submarine here. What's your first name, sir? Yeah. Jim. 
Most of you may think the submarine corps is part of the U.S. Navy. Well, you're wrong. They got their own uniforms. They don't wear the uniforms of the service Navy. They don't talk with the service Navy. They don't even associate with them. Am I right, Jim? That's the way it is. You go in the submarine corps as a young sailor or a young officer, you probably don't leave for the next 20 or 30 years, right? And they take care of their own. The lowest IQ, and I'm going to, this is a little bragging on Jim here. The lowest IQ allowed to be on a submarine is 120, and they go up from there. These are very bright men with very tight psychological testing. You're going to be in a tin box for six months with 100 men and not see daylight. You better have a very tight psychological profile. It's not optional, is it, Jim? Meeting these submarine veterans and debriefing them, and that's two skills I really have developed very well these past 41 years, is finding witnesses and taking statements. I know how to take a statement. Debriefing these submarine veterans has opened up everything I ever needed to know about this topic. At these briefings, they were told, gentlemen, the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks is one of known safe haven for the following reasons. Altitude above sea level, distance from major bodies of water, low population density, a fairly mild, fairly short winter until this winter, <laughs> <laughs> and plenty of water, um, not many minorities, no major cities, the uh, largest city in the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks is Springfield, Missouri, quarter million people. For all those reasons, the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks has been designated one of the safe havens. Anybody ever hear my friend Vince Finelli on Genesis Communications? One? Well, at least two. Okay. Vince is a friend. He refers to himself as a recovering banker. <laughs> He has a few hundred acres and, a, and maybe a, a hundred head of cattle or so down near Springfield. And he's pretty busy around town. He's a talk show host, kind of a political activist. He puts on the expos down there in the Springfield, Lebanon area. So Vince moves in there into Springfield from the East Coast. And he moved there because he thought it was a nice area. He didn't know, you know this information I'm putting out tonight. And being active in the community, he meets a lot of people. Uh, Kiwanis Club and Chamber of Commerce and various business associations. And he noticed he kept bumping into retired intelligence people. A lot of retired intelligence people. I didn't turn my phone off either. <laughs> uh, far more than you would expect in any given community. Granted, in any given community, you now Springfield, Missouri is a quarter million people. Sure, you're going to bump into a retired intelligence person now and then, maybe but not all the time, not all the time, no. So he gets my DVD, the whole family watches it in dead silence, and he calls me up and he says, John, now I know why I kept meeting all those retired intelligence people. <laughs> they knew, they know. The man whose business card, I just read his title earlier, he was um, at one of my pistol classes and at lunchtime, I'm talking about this. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't have his business card. I didn't know who, who he was at the time. So at, at lunchtime, I'm talking about these matters at my pistol class. And he smiles and nods his head. And he smiles and nods his head. And I've seen this before. Finally, I said, sir, what agency are you with? <laughs> and he hands me his business card. You don't have to get very high up in preparedness. In FEMA, our Dep Department of Homeland Security, to know about what I'm talking about. I was down in near Potosi uh, oh, about three or four years ago doing a presentation on this. And there was a woman from SEMA, the State Emergency Management Agency, S-E-M-A, State Emergency Management Agency. Nice lady. She's sitting in the back. I'm talking about preparedness and different threats and so forth. When I got to the part about rising ocean levels, now it's nighttime and we're in a building with no windows. When I got to that part, she put on sunglasses and didn't say anything the rest of the night. <laughs> It was kind of funny. Now, you all got my business card, which means you got my website. As of today, we've posted some things that previously I was selling. My article, No Need for Panic, which was written before I did my DVD. That's now a free download as of, as of today at my website. 
talks about these matters. This is also a free download. Really catchy title. Your tax dollars paid for this, by the way, Department of Defense. An Abrupt Climate Change Scenario and Its Implications for United States National Security, published October 2003 by Peter Schwartz and Doug Randall. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be about the scariest 22 pages you will ever read in your life. I guarantee it. Scariest 22 pages you will ever read. Now, in 2003, when this was written, it talked about two possible future scenarios, which, which at this point have become reality. The two possible scenarios they talk about and the consequences of those scenarios, one, the Gulf Stream slowing down dramatically, two, the Gulf Stream stopping. Scientists call it the North Atlantic Thermal Hailing Conveyor. That's a mouthful, say that fast 10 times. The North Atlantic Thermal Hailing Conveyor. Ben Franklin named it the Gulf Stream. This is where you get to find out how bad I am. Okay, here's the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, east coast of the United States, Cuba, and over here we got England, Ireland, and Scotland up in here. On my, on my website, you'll find a link to the U.S. Navy where they publish a brand new map every 24 hours of sea temperatures worldwide. Now there'll be a page that comes up, warning, warning, it'll hurt your computer. A lot of these government websites have that, just ignore it and go ahead. We also have a screen capture that was taken before June 12, 2010, which we'll get to why that's important in a moment. Okay, so we got Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. The Gulf Stream comes up here, gets to about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and starts going east by northeast. It used to pass all the way where it would split, some going to warm up the Navy, some going south to warm up England, Ireland, Scotland, and France. June 12, 2010, the Gulf Stream stopped about two miles out. And when you see the Navy map, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, it's published in colors to present the temperatures. When this was published in 2003, the scientists, they, and I interviewed scientists, politicians, uh, political scientists, uh, military people to come to their conclusions. This is the unclassified open source version. Almost always there's a classified version of, of a document like this. Almost always, right, Bruce? People can't see your head now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the open source version talks about the, uh, the following, if the Gulf Stream stops. Famine, war, mass migration of millions of people if the Gulf Stream stops. That's what this talks about. Your tax dollars paid for this. Anybody ever hear me on Deagle on Fridays? You do? Okay, a couple. I get to talk a little bit, but now I'm on Mondays with him also, and he lets me talk. In fact, I, I hosted his show, and he was gone today, so I had to talk the whole hour. But um, Genesis Communications has archives that anybody can access anytime they want. Here's your reference to the archives. We interviewed Dr. Luigiani Zangari, PhD scientist, the third Friday and fourth Friday of July 2010. Now, Dr. Zangari is an Italian. He speaks uh, English well enough that you can understand him. When we interviewed him at first, at third Friday, he said, well, we, we believe the Gulf Stream stopped. We have to recheck our calculations. We're not positive. Then he said something else that really caught my attention. Myself and most people who pay in the Gulf Stream, we know the Gulf Stream affects weather on the eastern seaboard and western Europe. That's pretty well known. What I didn't know, what Dr. Zangari told us, is that the Gulf Stream regulated the jet stream. Now, five miles above your head, young lady, right where you're sitting, is 200 mile an hour wind, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
It's called the jet stream. 200 miles an hour, five miles up. And it does this zigzag thing. Up and down like this. Over the north, there's three jet streams. One in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere, and one at the equator. I don't want to hear any questions about HARP. Yes, HARP can affect some weather some of the time. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Um, weather is mostly a consequence of two things, energy from the sun and what the jet stream does. That's what most of our weather is created by. Why is that important? Well, you may hear your local um, Dave Murray, for example, your local weather guy, weather gal, talk about the jet streams doing strange things we've never seen it do before. Anybody here? Okay, you've heard that, right? Okay. They won't go the next step and tell you why. Because it, the Gulf Stream's no longer regulating it. We're gonna, we'll get to that part. Remind me. Remind me. No, Harp can't do that. That's one thing Harp can't do. <coughs> regulating the jet stream means the weather behaves more or less in a dependable fashion when it comes to temperatures and precipitation. Now, this is an urban environment. We probably don't have any grain farmers here. Any grain farmers in the audience are used to be grain farmers? Rice, wheat, corn, soybeans, spelt, barley? Okay, I wouldn't expect there would be. Every business has a business model. The business model for growing grain is a five-year business model that for every bad harvest, you'll get four good ones. That's what they depend on, and they've been doing that for many, many decades. The land that they buy and lease, the equipment they buy and lease, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, everything they do is based on that being more or less the way it's gonna be. Now granted, there could be five good harvests and there could be two bad ones, but decade after decade, it's that four and one ratio. And you can build a life and build a business and depend on it. Guess what, that's gone. That business model is broken and it's gone probably forever in terms of human years because the jet stream is no longer being regulated by the Gulf Stream. Now, I'll answer your question now before I run off and forget it. <laughs> um, salt water behaves differently than fresh water. There is a univer university level experiment where they build a tank 10 feet by 10 feet, 100 feet long, full of fairly cold, let's say 45, 50 degree salt water, and you inject fairly warm 80 degree salt water at one end, there'll be a thermal barrier developed between the two. And that, that warm water will move all the way through that tank as a unit and get to the other end. As you introduce fresh water into the tank, the ability to have that thermal barrier breaks down and the water starts mixing. Because the oceans are the salt content of the oceans, the salt content of the oceans is what allows these, these ocean currents to do what they do. Melting freshwater ice in Iceland and melting freshwater ice in the Antarctic has been reducing the salt content of these oceans for decades. It's now cow flatulence. It's not Command Sergeant Major's F-350 diesel truck out there. No. In fact, the ice is melting from the bottom <laughs> at Iceland and Greenland. It's melting from the bottom. How could that possibly do be cow flatulence or Command Sergeant Major Page's uh, truck emissions? It couldn't be. Obviously not. As the salinity gets reduced, the Gulf Stream was slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. When I wrote this paper, no need for panic, in the oh, fall of 2005, published in January 2006, the Gulf Stream had lost officially about one-third of its mass and velocity, probably closer to half, but they were emitting one-third. At the time, they were saying in the fall of 2005, five to, ten, five to 20 years in the future, we think the Gulf Stream's gonna stop. All right, fast forward five years. What happened in the, in the Gulf of Mexico? The British Petroleum Oil Spill. <laughs> 